Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. So, are you ready to get started? <laughs> yes, I am. Super ready. I'm Jess. I'm Sid. <laughs> there you go. I'm Sid. And this is Malpractice Podcast. This is malpractice, and we are firing on all cylinders. All of them are go. And super professional work. Well, if I might. I don't. I don't know about that. <laughs> Cannot confirm or deny that one. Same. <laughs> what you will have is an entertaining time here. I think. Yeah, that's what you get. You look. We're gonna. We do our best with the facts. <laughs> we're going real in on this. I like this. Yeah. We do our best with the facts, and we don't hold back. And that's all we know. That should be Fox News' slogan. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Except they don't really do their best do, with the facts, do they? Anymore? They, they might do their best. Which is, yeah, okay. Which is trash. Yeah. How are you? I'm so tired. Your sister got married this weekend. Yeah, my sister was married last Friday. Shout out to Rebecca and Justin. Jess was the maid of honor. Yep, I was there. Oh, ooh. I was big, pregnant, Big tired. Yeah. And your makeup looked flawless. Oh, yeah. Shout out to them. They did a great job. Yeah. That makeup artist did a real good job. And Sydney was there. I was there. And she met my aunt and uncle. Well, she met a lot of people, probably. Actually. I met a lot of people, but your aunt and uncle really stand out because I like them a lot. Yeah. And we sat with them. So shout out to Aunt Mary. Yeah. And my uncle Henry. And he has a book. Your uncle Henry is precious. He has a book coming out. And I know. Yeah, he he was like, oh, if you know anybody who's into World War II, and I was like, I'm into World War II. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are into World War II. I love World War II. Like, it's a really f- stressful time to read about, but it's also so fascinating historically. Yeah, and I really like um, reading a couple different things about it that are like separate mm-hmm. spaces, like separate locations, and then how they intersect. I really like that. Yep, such a crazy time. What a crazy time for sure. Um, in other news, my dad was here. It was his belated birthday celebration. Happy birthday, Padre. My dad's name is Alan. Happy birthday to you. You are the best. <laughs> nice. That's the remix, baby. Ear, ear. <laughs> yeah. That was me doing the turntable. Scratching e- it. Ear. Scratchy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a great time. We went to a really good steak dinner at a place called B&B Butchers. That sounds like him. If you're ever in Houston and you want a good steak, it was flawless. Oh, wow. Okay. High praise. High praise. Yeah. What did Eric get? Me, Eric, and my mom shared a tent, um, whatever, some big ass steak for two people. We shared it between the three of us. Yeah. And we still had probably more than half of it left over. Damn. Like it was a massive amount of steak. And delicious. And then? And we had lobster mac and cheese. I love mac and cheese. They brought my dad a cheesecake. Oh, Like, unprompted, because it was his birthday. It was really sweet. Give the man a cheesecake. A cheesecake and a handwritten note. It was lovely. What did he eat? Did he just get his own steak? Yeah. He didn't have to eat off the community steak. No. <laughs> he got his own steak. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. He got, like, a Wagyu ribeye situation that was really tasty that's cool yeah my family has strong feelings about cuts of beef oh really yeah <laughs> very strong opinions you didn't know this about me but i i also have strong opinions about oh cuts of beef what's your favorite cut of beef um and a uh, one that i don't have to look at <laughs> <laughs> just as a vegetarian yeah. in case you <laughs> don't eat it but yeah just kidding in case you're unaware and then what else did you do We were, so in 2019, my husband Eric and I, for some backstory, bought a house that's like an old 1940s colonial house that had an attached apartment. And this apartment was a shit ass mess when we bought it. Yeah. And we had to do a lot of work on it. So my parents were here to, my my dad built me a sliding barn door. Oh, cool. For his birthday. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday, Dad. Thank you for building me a door for my rental apartment. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a cool rental apartment, too. It is cool. It is cool. Um, I think the barn door is going to be a big selling point because it's in front of the closet. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's cute. So that's what we did. That's basically it. Yeah. It was fun, though. Do you feel like you recovered from the wedding? 
No. Same. I'm so tired. I, I don't think I'll ever not be tired again. Jess gave me a directive before the wedding to get turned enough for her as well. And if I may, I feel like I followed instructions. I mean, you looked like you were having a good time. I was having a grand time. I was so tired. And also the next day I felt like hot garbage. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was worried about that. Yeah. I knew you were really drunk because Eric was trying to get you to leave and you like didn't want to leave. <laughs> I didn't want to leave because that's my go-to. I never want to leave a place. Yeah, you were like, come here. Oh, and Sydney felt my baby kick for the first time. And I immediately wept. <laughs> <laughs> There's the baby I cried empty. so hard that people were like, are you okay? Yeah, people thought something happened, something mm-hmm. bad. They thought maybe we got in a fight. We didn't. Eric was like, I just saw you weeping from across the table and I got very <laughs> concerned. Yeah, that was no, funny. It was a, cr- a happy cry. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> anyway, bye. <laughs> this job is so easy. <laughs> Imagine. You want to? No, but I think we should yeah, let's jump do it. in, right? Yeah, totally. So this is Women's History Month um, for the United States. Correct. And um, to kick off, we wanted to cover Dr. Mary Putnam Jacoby. She was, according to the NIH, an esteemed medical practitioner and teacher, a harsh critic of the exclusion of women from the professions, science, medicine, etc., mm-hmm. and a social reformer dedicated to the expansion of educational opportunities for women, for women in general. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, a bad bitch. Right. She was also a well-respected scientist supporting her arguments for the rights of women with the scientific proofs, proofs no, proofs. What the fuck is proofs? Did you say proofs with a double P? Yeah. Um, <laughs> proofs of her time. Okay. So she was fucking cool. She was very cool. Right. I found her and I was like, I love her. Why don't I know about her? Same. And this is a sentence we say a lot when we find cool people we've never heard about. And that's why we have to cover her. Yeah. So you know about her too. Yeah. So she was born August 31st, 1842 in London, England. Her father was an American, George Palmer Putnam, and her mother was a British woman named Victorian Haven Putnam. She was the oldest of 11 children. Yikes. That's so many kids. That's so many children. Where do they sleep? Yeah. No. How many bunk beds do you have? I think at the time people just shared bed, regular beds, right? Mm, miserable. It's a, it's a no for me. It's a no for me. But it's a yes from them. <laughs> Clearly. Um, her dad brought the family to London to establish an office of his NYC publishing company, Wiley and Putnam. So, like, she was a fun baby jet setter. And that's cute. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> of the 1840s. Imagine jet setting with 11 children. Well, she was the oldest, right? So she was born there. Yeah. So so maybe, maybe the rest were born easy. back in Yeah. when they got back, home. Back yeah. in the in the old US. <laughs> when she was 6, her family moved from London back to New York and she spent the rest of her youth there. When she was 9 years old, she almost drowned in an accident. When she was later reflecting on that, she wrote, "Life and what is it? Like, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. And to ask that at, like, 10, essentially, after you almost drowned, couldn't be me. Same. I'm going to start again okay. for the quote, but not for this. Please don't edit this. Okay. <laughs> Life, what is it? To be born, to eat, to sleep, to work, to play, to die, is the curious machinery of our bodies created merely to return after a short period to the dust from whence it came. That's how she reflected She's, At such a young age. She's a pretty deep individual. Yeah. I would have been like, woof. Mm-hmm. That was rough. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. That's Yikes. my reflection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yikesers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. She was taught at home by her brilliant mother, and then she attended a private school in Yonkers. Mm-hmm. She attended, after that, a public school for girls on 12th Street in Manhattan, and she graduated in 1859. Then she studied Greek, science, and medicine privately, With the likes of Elizabeth Blackwell, who is another notable physician and the first woman to receive a medical degree in the U.S. So she's, like, in really good company. Have we ever covered Elizabeth Blackwell? If we haven't, she's been on the list because I've definitely done some research about her. I definitely have, too. We should cover her at some point. Yeah, she's pretty pretty cool. Yeah. And other, like, scientific fancy women of the time. So she was, like, in that mix. Yeah. I say fancy woman because you had to have like money. You did <laughs> for sure. You had to. Yeah. You had to be white, mm-hmm. and you had to have a shitload of money. Mm-hmm. Facts. To be a fancy woman scientist, yeah. like let's be realistic <laughs> about the situation. Yeah, I love how you embrace the the term 
fancy woman. Yeah. Fancy woman scientist. That's what I'm going to put on my LinkedIn from now on. And should. She started writing also. So obviously, as we heard that quote, like she's a, she's deep, right? Like Sydney said. Right. So she was also a really talented writer. And she published short stories in the Atlantic Monthly and then in the New York Evening Post. Her first story, titled Found and Lost, was published in the Atlantic when she was just 17 years old. The piece paid about $80, which is like $2,000 now. So that's like a chunk of change, really. I mean, even now. For a 17-year-old, especially. Which her father playfully changed into dollar gold pieces to present to her, uh, which is cute. And we love a young writer, so that's... That's a cool thing she did on the side. Also, that's how you know that they were rich, because the dad took $2,000 and just casually changed it into, like, gold dollar (laughs) pieces to, like, make fun of her for it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That's, like... Yeah. That's a flex, I feel. Yeah. Uh, Throughout her life, she would go on to write both political essays and fiction, but she's best known for her medical writing, which included over 120 scientific articles and nine books. She's a very serious individual. Yeah, she's super serious. And she looks super serious, too. Yes. Like, you'll see a picture of her in our posts for this episode on on Instagram or whatever. She's a very serious-looking individual. Like, she looks like she's never cracked a smile in her life, which maybe she hasn't because she's... that. Go go ahead. I was about to agree with you aggressively. Yeah. No, that's all I wanted. She just looks super serious. She looks like she was born with frown lines. (laughs) A hundred percent. No, she... Yeah, she looks... She looks like the person you'd want your doctor to look like. You'd want your doctor to look like this person specifically Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because she has those two concern lines between her eyebrows that are like... At the ready. (laughs) I'm thinking hard at all times. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. And a very serious bun. Oh, yeah. I have a jokester bun. She has a serious bun. Same. This is a clown bun. This is, yeah, clown bun. Yes. This is a clown bun for for not fancy women. Yeah. (laughs) She was apparently so good at at writing in other languages that she was once even accused of plagiarizing an article that she published in French because it was that good. People were like, you must have ripped this off from a a native French speaker. And that's what people said about Sydney's thesis and dissertation. (laughs) You must have ripped this off from a fancy science woman. (laughs) Yeah. And she was like, nope, this is all original, baby. It's just me, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Although most of her articles in fiction and politics were signed with her own name, her medical articles are signed with the initials PCM because she thought that femme authorship would discredit her work and potentially anger the public. She's not wrong. She's right. It's extremely likely that she was right because at the time, men in medicine claimed that a medical education could make women physically ill. That thought process makes me physically ill. Right. Them saying that (laughs) makes you physically ill, for sure. Correct. They Mm -hmm. also thought that women physicians were endangering the profession, which... Is stupid. Or maybe you just have small dick energy. Might I I postulate that that's a possibility? (laughs) I'll just ask a fancy woman and she'll agree. (laughs) She'll agree. Uh, Jacoby would go on to work tirelessly proving them wrong and arguing that it was actually social restrictions that threatened female health... Which feels to me like she was literally a hundred years ahead of her time there. We should quote her now. Right. I'm like, social social restrictions, still, let's talk about it. Soapbox. Still, period. That's a, a different soapbox for another episode, but yeah. But we like that, so we keep it close. We kind of live on that soapbox. Mm-hmm. You know, like, we've made our home there. Yeah, we live there. So... Mary decided that she wanted to pursue medicine. Her father did not agree with that decision. He said that a career in medicine was, quote, a repulsive pursuit, which after hearing some doctor stories from friends, I don't necessarily disagree. Yeah. yeah. But he did agree to financially support her, which is, like we said, you got to be fancy. You got to be fancy. You have to. She went to college and got her degree from the New York College of Pharmacy, which made her the first woman ever to graduate from a U.S. school of pharmacy. Period. Queen. Queen. A queen. Queen shit. (laughs) That's big queen shit energy. Mm -hmm. She did that at the age of 19 with no formal education. So to the patriarchy, I say, take that. Yeah, She got you. Take that. She's got your number. And your stupid rules. And your stupid... Stop talking about periods, honestly. Stop talking about periods. We'll get there. 
At the time of her graduation in 1859, no medical schools in New York were actually admitting women to MD programs. So she started by studying medicine privately with Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, as we said, the first woman in America to earn a medical degree. Next, she went on to get her MD from the female Medical College of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia that was later changed to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Apparently, she was doing so well in school while at this university that she convinced the faculty to let her sit for her exams early. And this quote unquote special allowance made the dean there, Dean Edward Fusel, so mad that he resigned in protest after she graduated. Honestly, if you aren't raising enough hell to make a dean resign, What are you doing? I feel like I failed in life because I don't think a dean has ever resigned over me. But you did, um, you did defend your dissertation before people wanted you to. That's true. And you fucking passed that shit. But no one resigned. Yet. Thank you. But no one resigned and now I feel... Maybe they will. (laughs) Maybe I just left a trail of ruined careers behind me. One could only hope. So I just, when I think about a guy named Edwin Fusel... Yeah. ...who resigns over a 19-year-old taking her exams early... And passing them. I think he has the voice and facial hair of a walrus. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you see him in your head? Mm Mm-hmm. I see a walrus, yes. (laughs) With the top hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I bet he calls people like, good chap, old boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I bet he does. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, I think so. You you with me on this? Yeah, I hate okay. him. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Fuck this guy. <laughs> yeah. Luckily for basically everyone, when he left, they replaced him with a physician named Ann Preston, who became the first ever woman dean of a medical school. And so... Another person we should cover. Snaps to Ann as well. We don't care about you, walrus man. She said, good, scoot, walrus. Yeah, she said, bye. I'm taking okay. your spot. <laughs> yeah, anyway. During the Civil War, Mary served as a medical aide just casually while getting a med- medical education. So she's, like, also helping. Mm. In order to graduate, she had to write a thesis, and hers was written entirely in Latin, which is a flex now, and, like, also a flex then, because... It's a massive flex. You didn't have to do that, and she was just like, I'm gonna write, so I might as well write in Latin. Everyone's like, no, okay, can you also read it to me? Because what is happening? (laughs) (laughs) That's a dead language. You know that no one can read that. Oh, shit, maybe that's why she did it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. She's like, they, I'm just going to talk shit about them in my own thesis and they won't even know. How did her professors grade her? I'm sure they had to have, someone had to have been able to read that. Just fascinated. Yeah. I mean, I love her. And her title was Theory on the Function of the Spleen. After graduation, she went on to practice clinical medicine with Marie Zarenska. Oh, I did it right. That sounds good. No, I didn't. Zakruska? I don't know. There's a K somewhere in there. <laughs> Listen, I thought Zarenska was right. Then I realized there's no N in any of that. So, And Lucy Seawall at the New England Hospital for Women and Children in Boston. At this point, she decided that her education, while it provided an amazing opportunity, did not prepare her the way she had hoped to, mm-hmm. to become a doctor, right? So she started to outspokenly support the co-education of the sexes, arguing that she wanted the same training yeah. and clinical education that men were getting at older, more established schools. Yeah. And we love it. Be mad. Be mad. And also... I love to be mad. I feel like somebody who could finish medical school like it's a cinch and then be like, I don't think you adequately prepared me is a very self-aware individual. Yeah. I want more is what she said. Right. Because most people be like, I'm good. I'm going to go yeah, I'm chilling. do whatever I can do to get money. <laughs> I'm going to go be a casual doctor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But she was a fancy science lady, and that's it. (laughs) She sure was. So she decided to continue her education in Paris, where she attended lectures and clinics, sat in on classes at the Medical School of the University of Paris. I was going to try and say it, but... (laughs) I wanted you to say it in French. (laughs) No. Where she eventually decided to apply. So let me just put that thing back, flip it, and reverse it. She attended lectures, clinics, and sat in on classes... To just continue, like, to learn more before she even applied. She just went over there to just observe. Right. Um, But at that time, they refused to admit women. Mm -hmm. She did not like this, and she also did not like the word no. So Mm -mm. she hung around Paris taking classes at other smaller schools until they finally relented and let her in. She was probably, like, 
one of the most annoying people to them, like every day. Good morning. Yeah. Like I'm here again. Hi, it's me. I'm back. And imagine doing it's this. It's me. Hi. At this point, <laughs> she's she like said. in her early 20s yep. in an all male setting. All the yep. professors are male. All of the classmates are male. Yep. And she's sitting in the front of the room like, you're going to teach me. Yeah. You're going to do it. That's ballsy. Yeah. Mary's got balls. Yeah. We love her. So they relented. They let her in after a ton of negotiating and a letter from the Minister of Education telling them that they basically had to admit her as the first woman to be educated there, probably because the Minister of Education was like, if you don't get this woman <laughs> off my front step, she's been camped here for several years at this point. She has sent me so many emails. <laughs> I gotta have it. Um, but it doesn't mean that she was given, like, equal treatment. So yeah. when she was attending classes after she was admitted, she was required to enter through separate doors into lectures and sit at the front near the professor. That's kind of, okay, that's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. That's weird to me. Uncomfortable. Despite the walls put around her, she graduated with honors, duh, in 1871 and was the second woman to receive a degree from that university. In <laughs> if there's that name again, I cannot say. You won't and do it. also received a bronze medal for her thesis. That's so impressive. And that's on period. Now I'm yeah. also a little disappointed that no one gave me a medal after I finished my thesis, but okay. Do you know the first thing I thought when I saw that? I was like, oh, I need to get Sydney a medal. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Sydney needs a medal. Who did, why didn't we give her a medal? I found out recently that when you graduate from your PhD in, I want to say, Sweden, they give you a top hat and a sword. Oh, that's not fair. And I got really super jealous and mad that I don't no one gave me a sword I'm a sword and Eric was like you could just buy a sword and I'm like it's not the same no being given a sword for your achievements is like way cooler it's different it's next level buying yourself a sword is shit. not cool no just if you wanted to do that you could just go to the what the renaissance fair the sword depot <laughs> sword depot big yikes <laughs> Thank you. If there's a sword depot, I'm not going there. I guarantee you there is, and I guarantee you we would not be welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After five years of studying medicine in Paris, she came back to the U.S. She established her own medical practice in New York. And at this time, there were very few hospitals for, specifically, where a woman could legally work as an attending physician. So if you're not familiar with that structure, you get out of medical school, you're a resident, and then when you finish that residency, you get to be an attending, right. I think. That's what they taught me at um, Grey's Anatomy. I almost said at Grey's Anatomy. Like, I went there for Same. my medical education. <laughs> Grey's Anatomy, At the yeah. University of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> that's what I, that's how yeah. I think about it. Where all the best physicians go. So, she also worked in research. She became a professor at the Women's Medical College of New York and Mount Sinai Hospital with her mentor, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. She became the second woman to be a member of the Medical Society of the County of New York, and she was admitted to the American Medical Association, which is no small feat, as we know. That's, yeah, that's a big right. deal. Yeah. Everywhere she taught, people also say that she helped raise the educational standards, and she would regularly go to the slums and practice medicine for the poor in her downtime. So she's one of the people who was really in medicine to help other people. To do the work. She, right, She was right. like, I believe in this, yeah. Yeah, she really wanted to do the work, right? In addition to that, in 1872, she organized the Association for the Advancement of Medical Education of Women to address the shortcomings that she had personally observed in women's ability to get a medical education and become trained physicians. Mm -hmm. And that eventually turned into the Women's Medical Association of New York City, and she served as the president of that organization from 1874 to 1903. During her entire career, she continued to actively campaign for women to be admitted into leading medical schools like Johns Hopkins. I mean, seriously, she's like, what else is there? Yeah. <laughs> it's, in 1873, she married Abraham Jacoby, who was a New York doctor and researcher, He's often referred to as the father of pediatrics, so maybe we'll cover him also in another episode. Oh, yeah. Um, they apparently met because he was present when she submitted her application for membership in the Medical Society for the County of New York. And he was probably like, that's a hot bitch, you know? I know. He saw her put that <laughs> application down. He said, put that application down, flip it, and reverse it. Yeah. 
The same year they married, she started a children's dispensary service at Mount Sinai Hospital. And from 1882 to 1885, she lectured on diseases of children at New York Postgraduate Medical School. Can I just say? Go ahead. Yeah, just say. I don't know what a children's dispensary service is, and I could not find it. It sounds like you're giving drugs to children. I think it's like, I think it is like a pharmacy. For children. For like children's diseases. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just saw dispensary and I was imagining like weed? them selling weed to children. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I know that's not what it was. I'm not going to shame them. I mean. I'm not. I'm not. You can't make me. I feel like giving a child weed is one of the few things that I will shame someone for. I'm not going to shame. In the 1800s? Oh, no. Nah. In the 1800s, they were giving children probably cocaine. So yeah. weed is like the least of your problems. I think it's. I think it is a pharmacy. Okay. I think so. Fascinating. But I also did research and I was like, okay. I don't know what that means, but that's what it's called. So bing bong. I couldn't figure it out. And it was like, she started one. Okay. I was like, sounds good. She went to like pharmacy school. Pharmacy. Yeah. yeah, she did. I bet you're right. She's cool. Whatever. If she's doing something, I'm on board. Except I know of like a lot of the women suffragettes of the time were like extremely racist we're like white women should get the right to vote yeah yeah and nobody else bye bye so yeah but if you didn't find anything specific she did a lot of writing if it was out there you probably would have found it right yeah i mean i yeah i i I still like her until until i'm shown something to change my mind same um we can do whatever we want with that piece (laughs) i was thinking about that when i was researching no it's worth bringing up So, she opened a small children's ward at the New York Infirmary in 1886. She and Abraham had three children, two daughters, and one son. Two of their children passed away early in life. Mm -hmm. Her one surviving daughter was educated by Mary herself. She was like, no, I don't trust none of you hoes. (laughs) Fair. And I'll do this on the side. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, In my spare time, I'll educate my child as well. (laughs) Mary got the... Boylston Prize from Harvard in 1876 for her essay, The Question of Rest for Women During Menstruation, which she wrote in response to a publication that claimed that any physical or mental exertion during menstruation could lead a woman to become infertile. She admittedly didn't believe in this at all, and she tested her idea. So this is like her kind of, I mean, she's really fucking cool anyway, but like her battling against the theories around women menstruating and people menstruating at the time were her calling card. Like, she was like, this is so stupid. Yeah, exactly. So for a little background on where her paper in this whole fiasco came from, in 1873, a man named Dr. Edward Clark published a paper titled, quote, Sex and Education or A Fair Chance for Girls. And in this paper, he claimed that women could simply not cope with the traditional academic demands placed on men. And he essentially said that women who even try to push themselves to compete with men put themselves at an increased risk for what amounts to having a nervous collapse that could potentially cause sterility. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is a major fuckaroo, number one. Also. Do you think, listen, Yeah. do you think this is, like, an easy way for men to be published at the time? (sighs) I think that this ideology is just 98% of their peers are men. Yeah. Like, there's not going to be a lot of pushback. I know that he wrote five editions of this book. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think he was just like, and another thing about women, they should, yeah. you know, only walk before 8 p.m. Like, I think it's just so right. lazy. You could be right, because point number two that I wanted to make was his book, this whole thing, argued that educating women at the same level as men could lead to long-term, dam- long-term damage to a woman's reproductive organs. Hmm. What I absolutely love about this is that he's basically saying that Whether a woman wants an education or not, if it has even the potential to harm her reproductive capacity, let's not risk it because everyone knows that women are only useful if they have a functional baby maker. Right? I actually think this man is still alive today. Is he really? No. (laughs) 
Oh. <laughs> but I oh think I'd be like 150 years old. What the fuck I am think I talking about? These ideas are so archaic. That's why I said that. Why could I not? <laughs> I'm so wow. disappointed in myself that I fell for that. You were like, is he really? Hey, he is alive? When I said Jeez. it, I was thinking, I was like, let's go egg his house. Yeah, down. <laughs> um, This man makes me so angry that I was like sweating when I took notes on this part of the script. Yeah, yeah, he sucks. And he was a professor at Harvard for quite some time during and after writing that. So just throwing that out there. These are the type of people who were, like, maintaining the status quo. Who were arguably indoctrinating our education system and students. Absolutely. And the people who were treating women as patients, right? Point number three. I actually read part of this stupid-ass paper, and what I find to be even more fucked is that it reads as though he thinks he's doing women a favor by pointing all of this out. Oh, yeah. The tone of the paper is like he's saving them from themselves and making womankind better by pointing out the reason that they shouldn't do, quote, like, men's jobs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He essentially argues that a woman's body has to put all of its efforts into developing reproductive machinery. And when young women work their brains too hard, that process suffers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I want to fucking headbutt him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He sucks. He's he's. He's garbage, period. Okay. We should do a hate episode about him. Oh, okay. We haven't done a hate episode in a while. In a while, yeah. It's been yeah. a minute. Let's do a hate. Yeah, let's do a hate episode. Man, this episode is really churning out the next couple of episodes. <laughs> Part of the problem with refuting these really stupid and completely unfounded claims is that women had basically just now been allowed to complete and get a secondary education. Right. So there was no data of any kind either to support or refute these claims. Which is why he could just say whatever he wanted. Exactly. That's exactly why. But Mary was determined to change that. She's a bad bitch. No, she was like, you fuck around, you're going to find out. You find out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she collected physiological data on women throughout their menstrual cycle, even including things like muscle strength test, sphygmographic tracings of pulse rate, their ability to, like, squeeze a thing hard, Mm -hmm. uh, variations throughout their period of their general overall health, their strength, their agility throughout different points in their monthly cycle. She took all kinds of notes. She provided tables. She provided statistics. And she concluded that, quote, there is nothing in the nature of periods to imply the necessity or even the desirability of rest she was probably like i never in my life have desired rest no i don't know what the word rest means yeah so why don't you mind your own business correct at this time many people believed that women were at the mercy of their menstrual cycles the argument was that women were made lazy incompetent and even like insane while menstruating which (laughs) if a man Mm -hmm. had to have a period it would be a fucking national holiday Mm -hmm. listen here We do everything that anyone who doesn't have a period does, and we do it while bleeding out. Profusely. How's that? Yeah. And we do it with smiles sometimes, and we do it at work. Eric and I had this conversation the other day because I was like, if you think about it, there are probably Olympic athletes who have been menstruating while at the Olympics. Yeah. That's winning. fucking insane. Yep. That's a great point. Okay, keep going. So... Mary argued against this at every chance. She's like, I hate this. Stop talking about me. Right. I'm going to collect my data. So she did. She was like, give me all this data. I'm going to analyze. Mm-hmm. Then she published her research response to this dude's book. Hers was titled The Question of Rest for Women During Menstruation. And it was a bombshell paper. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. She disproved a ton of misconceptions about menstruation and the capability of the female body using data and research and not just my fucking first thought that popped in my head in the morning like Joe Schmo over there. What do you think that the guy that wrote that paper looked like? Um, I think he looked like a thumb. <laughs> you think he had a severe case of thumb face? <laughs> yeah. D- Dr. Edward Clark? Yeah. Thumb face extraordinaire. Yeah. I bet you're right. Yeah, I think he's a thumb face. And we'll let you know because we're going to do a hate episode about it. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to start it today. (laughs) I'm in on it. Um, 
So Mary's research became an important part of medical literature and contributed towards the changing social perception of the female body. One source says, quote, in 1876, almost to confirm Mary's intellectual victory, her paper won that Boylston Medical Prize at Harvard, the school at which Clark taught. LOL. (laughs) Basically, they were like, hey, we know you teach here and we don't care. She's right. And you're wrong. Yeah, you're wrong and you're dumb. Also, just bring some like a shred of evidence. Well, he can't. He can't. And he won't. He won't do any evidence. He's short. He's short. Throughout her career, a lot of her achievements were at least partially possible because she was mentored by the incredible women who came before her and helped her to make a seat for herself at the table. And But she saw that, and like a badass, she continued to do the same for other women, mentoring young aspiring physicians and continuing to lobby for universities to accept women to study medicine throughout her entire career. Absolutely. We love that. In 1891, she wrote a paper on the history of women physicians, which was basically titled Women in Medicine, and that was added into this book, that was called Women's Work in America Mm -hmm. um, that included a bibliography of writings by American female and femme doctors mentioning over 40 of her own works. So that's fucking cool. Yeah, it is. She's like, I'm going to write the history of me. (laughs) I'm an important part of the history of female doctors. And she is. Yeah, she is. Yeah. In 1894, she wrote Common Sense Applied to Women's Suffrage, which went on to be reprinted and used to support the suffrage movement in the U.S., She also contributed to the movement by founding the League of Political Education. Yeah. So she was politically active in addition to the fact that she was just a prolific writer and she was writing really important pieces that were shaping the national consciousness about her profession. Yeah. Yeah. And women in general, too. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because of how influential it was at the time, I want to read a short excerpt from her essay, Women in Medicine. Quote, When people began to think of educating women in medicine, a general dread seemed to exist that if any tests of capacity were applied, all women would be excluded. This profound skepticism felt about women's abilities was thus as much manifest in the action of the friends to their education as in that of its opponents. Mm -hmm. But by 1882, the friends dared to call upon those who believe in the higher education of women to help set the highest possible standard for their medical education. A career is open to women in the medical profession, a career in which they may earn a livelihood, a career in which they may do missionary work among the poor of our own country, a career that is practical, that is useful, that is scientific. And I find that really profound. Yeah, I love that. In addition to being an outspoken feminist and suffragist, an incredible physician, an outspoken advocate for women's education. Mary was also a prolific writer, like Jess said, so it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone to hear that when she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, she actually wrote a detailed documentation of her symptoms and ended up self-publishing a paper on it titled Descriptions of the Early Symptoms of the Meningeal Tumor Compressing the Cerebellum, period, from which the writer died, period, written by herself. That's the full title period. She died on June 10th, 1906. She was posthumously inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993. Her contribution to the status of women within the medical profession was incalculable, and we think that Mary was an incredibly cool individual. We hope you think so, too. Yeah, and that's what we know about that. And that's what we know about Mary. She's cool. Follow up later for our hate episodes on all the people who tried to keep her down (laughs) yeah yeah i'm down i can't wait for that series we should call it like in parentheses haters mary's haters (laughs) mary's haters volume one (laughs) yep thank you for listening if you have a recommendation for someone we should cover someone we should hate (laughs) someone we should uh, (laughs) i'm just kidding a topic we should do an episode on please a dms on instagram malpractice podcast or send us an email at malpractice podcast at gmail.com she's not kidding you can you can dm us about someone we should hate (laughs) yeah we're down feel free to leave us a review wherever you like to listen to your podcast you can find all of our stuff on youtube as well if you're interested in that 
and we love to hear your views. We actually read them, I promise. We screenshot every single one and send it back and forth to each other. <laughs> we love to hear your feedback. And then we talk about it live on the next episode. <laughs> we absolutely do. Uh, so don't forget, malpractice, malpractice makes, makes perfect. perfect. Bye. Bye.